This is premiere night at the Cannery Cinema in San Francisco. A new movie is opening. It's called Tell Me a Riddle. It stars Melvin Douglas, Leela Kadrova, and Brooke Adams. This is a special movie because this is the first time actress Lee Grant has ever directed a major motion picture. This picture is also the first production for three Bay Area women who fought against all odds to make this movie with their company, Godmother Productions. Academy Award-winning actress Lee Grant said after she read the script, she felt compelled to direct the movie, because the movie was about people she cared about. It's about uh, two people, played by Melvin Douglas and uh, Leela Kadrova, who are in their 70s and uh, who have been married for 47 years and who can't get along anymore. They can't even talk, they can't, when they're in the same room, there's been no communication. And when he does try to communicate with her, she turns off her hearing aid. They want to do different things with the end of their lives. And what about me? Alone, without you. You always leave me. How did I leave you? You shut off your hearing. You... Go inside you, back to Oshana, to your books, 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 always your books. And so they come to the point where they couldn't get along anymore and they were going to separate. When something happens to her, she gets sick. And he takes her to visit their children. And she doesn't get along with the children because they treat her like uh, she's a seven-year-old and she has no connection with him. When they get to San Francisco, she connects with her granddaughter who's played by Brooke Adams. And she finds with her and with this place uh, her past. And the more that she finds herself, the more her husband falls in love with her. They find that same kind of passion with the same intensity at 70 as they had when they were 15 and 16. Godmother Productions is the brainchild of these three women, 34-year-old Susan O'Connell, 26-year-old Mindy Afram, and 25-year-old Rachel Lyon. All had worked in some aspect of production. Susan, as a matter of fact, is an actress, but none had ever produced a major motion picture. It took them four years to raise the money for the film. They talked with 5,000 potential investors before they got commitments from 35. The movie cost $1.8 million. Many people said they were in over their heads. The three young women, inexperienced in movie making, couldn't produce a feature film. Tell me, how did you arrive at the name Godmother Productions? It took us a long time. We had absolutely no idea what to name ourselves. We went through at least hundred and. We tried Mindy, Rachel, and Susan. I mean, you know, <laughs> there was one that was Ms. Catchy. and more, you know, Mrs. I mean, we just went through everything. But it basically, it turned down to we got two bottles of wine instead of one. So we were feeling very good, and just all of a sudden, it just sort of flowed out. What was the most difficult thing in this project? Fund. Susan. Raising. <laughs> Fund raising. Fund raising is... Is that two words or one? I, who knows? One. I, it is the one. most one. horrible <laughs> thing that you... Rachel and I, at one point, were in Chicago, and <laughs> it was quite near the end. And you, you go for a long time on a spirit of, we ha of course we're going to do this, because you have to really have that feeling in order to have anyone invest in you. But there was a moment in time when we were in Chicago and it was, we had a month more, and there was a deadline on this perspective, as Rachel said, if we didn't have it all, then we had to give what we had back. And we got it, and we finished it, and we got, the, most of the last of the money came from Chicago, and then we came back to San Francisco and got the final money. Okay, and so. the last day that we needed it, we got it. Now, this project is of particular interest because it has a lot of firsts. It is your first major feature film, and it is the first directorial debut of Lee Grant. She had more to say about it and more insight into it than anybody else we had spoken to. So it was very clear, I mean, it was, a very, it was a very quick decision on our part because it was obvious that she had the most interest and the most love for it from only having, it, having, it, having read it once. What about Melvin Douglas? What was he like to work with? He is a one-take man. I mean, if you know what that means, he, uh, he's on. The minute the camera starts, he's on. And I think that his, his dynamic with Lilia, how they joined together, 
is why the film worked. Do you remember that song you used to sing to me? What? You don't remember? <laughs> Your new movie, The Consultant, what's that about? It's about the people who make campaigns for candidates. In this case, it's about a, a man who's running for mayor and the consultant, and it's about the amorality of the people that make those media decisions. What would you tell other women who would like to make films, who are thinking of making films? What, what kind of advice would you give them? We'd go still say it. go for it. Do it. Do it. Go for it's it. Very it's important. Really it's wonderful. very important right now that women go out there and do it. And uh, it's, very, it's much harder than it will be for anybody else, especially young women. But uh, there's nothing else. It, it is... Uh, important that we're women doing it just in order to find out that talent has no sex talent is talent which is my philosophy so I love the movie and you know this sounds like the all-american success story except the characters this time are women women who fought against all odds who made it in an industry dominated by men who believed and persevered you know, this whole story has the makings of a great movie, and I know just a production company who could produce it. Stay with us this evening. We'll take a short break. We'll be right back. It's tough in the last few years where if you don't have a better than average bucking horse or bull, uh, you're just not going to win. For every good horse you can draw, there's, there's another, another horse that you're not going to win any money on. I had a good horse, uh, too, too good a horse, really. <laughs> Fuck me off. It's true, the bucking bronx and the nasty bulls are the stars of the show just as much as the cowboys. They're special animals, and it takes special people to find them and care for them. This is the Christensen Ranch just outside Eugene, Oregon, home of the largest private producer of rodeos in the world, the Christensen Brothers. But now there are sons and daughters and granddaughters, a whole family, today 12 of them, in this same valley where they've been living for almost 60 years, still run that old family business. It started here. You know, they'd get up a few milk cows in the steer or two. And <laughs> they'd invite the friends and they'd come have a rodeo, charge 10 cents. <laughs> that was the admission. At 90 years of age, Molly Christensen is the grand dam of the rodeo world. A few years ago, the Rodeo Cowboys Association presented her with this trophy of appreciation for decades of promoting the sport. I imagine I've fed as, about as many cowboys as any woman in the state. When Molly's eldest son, Henry, took the family on the road in the early 40s, they used to walk the animals and walk with them from show to show. He and his brother, Bob, have handed the reins to younger Christensen's today, but they still call Henry the Big Apple. Well, you take when a man gets 70 years old and been in it all his life and started out like we did, uh, you're either going to make a success or something or you're going to well, go the other way, aren't you? Yeah. So you know your business? Yes, sir. You gotta know your business to haul 50 to 60 head of stock and feed to more than 40 rodeos each year. And that means providing a complete rodeo, too. The trucks, the tickets, the clowns, we mean everything. Now imagine doing this in a different town each week for five months, and you'll begin to see why the Christiansons are such an amazing family. Bob Christensen Sr. still manages that pace, but by and large, the operation is run by his son, Bob Jr. We're up and down California, Oregon, Washington, uh, Idaho, once in a while Nevada, once in a while Montana, and I don't really feel that uh, we'll get too much bigger than that. Uh, you start doing that much more, then you'll never be able to get home. 
you got to keep in mind each new town you go into, no matter how tired you are and wore out from driving it, this is these people's once a year shot, and they're all pumped up for the rodeo, and they've hired you to come in and do a job. Well, this is what it's all about, the bulls in the Bronx that try to toss you into the stands. Family or no family, you ain't got a good rodeo if you don't have good animals. The Christensen stock is not just good, the riders say it's the best. You can't train them to buck, they gotta be a natural bucking horse. If I could train one of them horses to buck, uh, I wouldn't have to spend seventy-five or eighty thousand dollars a year buying them. The best way to find an animal is to get one on lease and take him. Uh, a lot of animals can buck like heck in their their backyard, so to say, but put them on a truck and home five hundred miles, and uh, they don't take it out of them. So you got to find one that can travel as well as buck. You can't hurt the animals, and. Uh, I don't know who would want to hurt him. Uh, if you talk to uh, any professional athlete, I'm sure if he's hurt, uh, he can't perform on the field or play ball or whatever he's doing. An animal can run or can buck if it's hurt. Uh, we take an awful lot of pride in him and pay a lot of money for him and keep him fed good and uh, try and keep him in really decent shape so they will buck. It's how uh, I make my living. If my horses and bulls quit bucking, I don't have a job. The Christensen's don't just bring animals for the show, they are the show. Daughter-in-law Kathy carries the flags and competes in barrel racing, and Henry's daughters are a team of trick riders. Sherry put on a show by herself today in San Jose because her sister Linda suffered a broken leg doing this. I think we put on a rodeo that's family entertainment that people really like. It's fast and it's colorful. You have to hustle and get with it, you know, when you rode down, because you're constantly on the road traveling, you know, and then when you get there, it's got it set up things and get, you know, get things ready because people just come and sit and watch it. You got to have color and showmanship to it. That's the secret of it. There's a lot to it. If you ain't got the showmanship and just got a bunch of bucking horses and bulls, that doesn't mean you just well stay home. The glamour fades with the end of the show, and the family begins to pack up for a 700-mile trip to the next rodeo. Oh, you're kind of glad it's over, but uh, you're going on to the next one. Uh, one thing uh, rodeo people don't like, and that's to be around a rodeo after it's over. I don't think there's a lonelier place in the world than rodeo grounds after the rodeo's over. Everybody likes to load up and get out and get on to the next one. I never went through the sixth grade. <laughs> And what other kind of damn work could I get into? <laughs> and I don't like nothing else. I'm just proud of my family, and that's about all I can tell you. So the bulls in the Bronx don't walk from show to show anymore, and a lot of the cowboys got here today on 727. But just ask the Christensen family. There's still a lot of road in rodeo. Stay with us, we'll be back in just a minute. are high school students. They are very fast skiers and they're learning to ski even faster. But right now, racing down this slope, they are doing homework in a school that teaches reading, writing, and racing. It's called Ski Etude. Ski Etude is the only school in the West that combines good ski instruction with everything else you can learn in any prep school, from algebra to history. The school was the brainchild of a man whose family has been involved with the U.S. Olympics for years, Don Stenmeyer. We decided it was time to 
do what we could to keep our best racers in the far west because the facilities for racing and training here are much better than they are in the east. The seasons are longer, the mountains are bigger, and some of the better coaches are here. Now sometimes you have to emphasize academics more and sometimes during the year you have to emphasize skiing more. The fall quarter is primarily dry land training in the morning with a class schedule in the afternoon with a heavy academic load. The winter quarter is our skiing quarter with a light academic load of two classes and a heavy load of skiing of about six hours a day. The spring quarter is totally academic combined with field trips. Now is this a high school that also lets students ski or is it a ski camp that also teaches algebra? Well it's neither. Um, we try to put equal emphasis on skiing and on a on a uh, racers, if you will, or a student's education. Uh, we like to think we give 100% attention to both. Share that around and draw the, the color that you see. If you can see any dark lines in it at all. Sometimes Eastern Academies have classroom teachers who double as ski coaches, but not at Ski A2. The teaching is high caliber. If you're looking for a place to kick back and play more than study, this is not it. It does eliminate the temptation to play hooky to practice your Schuss and Vedel once in a while. As an alternative, it was a good alternative compared to public schools because like I was getting a lot of uh, flack and stuff from the teachers and public schools because I'd be gone for weeks on end and here it just, it takes care of it. If you're gone, Brian Marsh has a passion for skiing homework. and his problem for reconciling that passion with schoolwork is not unusual and it's not that he hates to study either. You get, you get, the, same, you get the same thing out of school here as you would in the public school. It's in a public school, you go over it and over it and over it. You know, you, you do it until you're just bored stiff with it. And here you do it, if you learn it and you know it, you go on. You know, sometimes school's fun, sometimes it's just, it's really not there. I don't know, some, so, sometimes I think school's in the way. But it's like anything else. It has its bad times and its good times. Same with skiing. Brian's relationship with his equipment is much like a Mountie's relationship with his horse. You take good care of your skis, and your skis will take good care of you. The coaches take good care of everybody here. Brian says he likes them because they are first and foremost good skiers, especially Ruben, who works on the basics. Once in a great while, a really big opportunity comes up, a chance to test yourself and show your stuff. Today is the day for Brian and a dozen other Ski Etude students. They're competing against 80 others in the U.S. Junior Olympics. You don't compete here for money or for hundreds of cheering fans. There are none. You perform for the Scouts, the Olympic Scouts, and a shot at the U.S. Olympic training team. There will be two events today, Giant Slalom and Downhill. Brian is strongly favored in both races. From the top of this mountain to the finish line where I'm standing is more than a third of a mile. Now these young racers will do this in less than a minute. Keep in mind that they're only 14 or 15 years old, hitting speeds over 40 miles an hour. Not one of them will tell you that he's not just a little scared at the beginning of the run. Brian came in second, but he's smart enough to know that training for the Olympics is more than learning how to ski well. 
There is emotional and psychological training that begins even before that. Because, as in most Olympic sports, ultimately, you're out there alone, and you have to learn to answer to yourself. Right now, I just want to just keep skiing, because the Olympics is a long ways off. So I got a long, you know, it's, I'm only about 15. You know, I got, I got a lot of years ahead of me. I, I can't want too much too fast. I take it as it comes. But someday. Someday. Someday I'll be there. <laughs> Los Trancos Woods, California. If you lived here, you'd be home now, but you don't. Neither do the Beach Boys, who live in Malibu, nor the Beatles, who came from Liverpool, England. The world is full of small, unlikely communities who've given birth to great musical traditions. This is not one of them. In fact, these are not even real musicians, but these people are in tune with life. This is the Los Trancos Woods Community Marching Band. For more than 20 years, it has been refuge for a dissonant core of computer builders, Stanford academics, and legislators. The only requirement is that you love to make music. Now, you don't have to actually play music, you just have to love to. The band's motto is, hey fella, what you do in your own home and office is your business. In real life, I'm director of a computer science department at one of the local colleges, but I really, I really get off playing with this band. I've been with the band for 12 years, and we're building things up and want to win the Pulitzer Prize someday. Other times, I have my own company called Vituperative Associates, but uh, today, this is where I really am. This is it, isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> this is it today, yes. We're serious about that. We want to win the Pulitzer Prize. I think. It's those red pills I keep taking. <laughs> The Pulitzer Prize banned in the United States, the first one. I didn't make any money in the brain surgery business, so I decided to make less money being a musician. That didn't work, so what the heck, I joined the common folks and started designing computers. That's our goal, <laughs> right. It is, it is. <laughs> in real life, of course, I'm the president of Standard Oil. I mean, that's obvious. If the band members are not professional musicians, what they play are not professional instruments. In fact, obviously, some of them aren't even instruments at all. Half of them were born in basements and garages. What is it? It's a couple of popless popsicle sticks with a rubber band in between, and you just blow through it. But what this sad society does best is march. They'll march at the drop of a hat. In fact, they'll play the hat. They march in parades across the United States of America. They do Thanksgiving parades. They do Fourth of July parades. But can they do indoor parades? You bet they can at the Keystone in Palo Alto. Also a rehearsal for a big St. Patrick's Day parade coming up on Sunday. A lot of these people, I think, are very serious during the daytime. They have scientific jobs, they do research, they're very dedicated, and this is their chance to go out and act crazy so that they don't go crazy. Sound like that makes you happy. <laughs> very, very. Yeah. For me, it's a place where I can kind of jump out of my image once in a while and uh, just have a ball, be a kid, and uh, you know, well, you're doing a good job. Why would somebody want to join the band today? Oh, because of the skill and musicianship and the craft involved. Zero. <laughs> right. 
when I was in junior high, I wanted to be in the band, but I couldn't with a violin. And so I said I could with uh, here, so I did. And this is the only marching band in the world with a violin. Probably. Well, as I told the band myself, the laughter and the fun is so infectious, why, if I had an instrument, I'd join them myself. I do have an instrument. Well, why not? That starts with C, and that rhymes with P, and that stands for what made this country great. By now, we're all in a marching frenzy for the big parade tomorrow. Okay, so nobody showed up to watch, but the Los Trancos Woods Community Marching Band always shows up, and by George, they're going to march, downpour or not. Remember, when the going gets tough, the tough get wet. <laughs> So the Silicon Valley is now famous for a marching band. Okay, they couldn't play with John Philip Sousa, but then John Philip Sousa couldn't be a semiconductor. We'll be back in just a minute.